Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this event today. I'm Ben Zyker, a resident scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute. It's rather unusual for me to be seated on the extreme left wing of anything <laughs> at this table today, so who knows what surprises may emerge uh, during today's discussion, which I anticipate will be extremely interesting um, in the context of this topic, because I was very fortunate indeed to have uh, gathered together a, a really outstanding panel to discuss the municipal um, litigation aimed at the fossil fuel companies in the context of, uh, of their statements or non-statements in their municipal um, bond offerings. In any event, uh, we're going to start in alphabetical order uh, with uh, David Bookbinder from the Niskanen Center. So David, go ahead, 15 minutes. Great, thank you. Um, before I begin, I have to disclose that the, as some of the trade press has picked up, uh, the tenth climate nuisance case has or is going to be filed today. I'm co-counsel. The Scanner Center is co-counseling the next climate nuisance case. Uh, the details on that are embargoed till 2:30, so in about an hour, I'll be able to more freely discuss that case and all the good things that are going to happen with it. Um, but meanwhile, let's swing into the uh, the issue right now of bonds. Okay, where's where's the PowerPoint? Where's where's it going to show up? On the screen there. Okay, do I? I know, I understand. Okay, hey, there it is. All right, great. I didn't realize I had that authority. Okay, much ado about nothing. Here we go. There we go. This is the biggie. Exxon in its petition under rule. Uh, Use the mic, okay. Exxon in its Rule 202 petition in the Texas court said, uh, went through all these bond offerings and said, you don't disclose sea level rise, you don't disclose, you don't disclose, and even worse, I'll, I'll quote what they say, even more troubling, those few disclosure statements in San Mateo's bond offerings, and then they say for San Francisco and the other cities, that reference sea level rise disclaim any ability to predict whether a rise in sea level or any other climate change impact might occur, and that this disclosure, this, appeared in a section of the bond offering with the heading risk of sea level changes and flooding. Oh, and this is what they what Exxon points to. Here's an excerpt from the immediately preceding paragraph. In May 2009, the California Climate Change Center released a final paper, et cetera, et cetera. The paper concluded that significant properties at risk of flooding from 100-year flood events as a result of a 1.4 meter sea level rise the paper further estimates that the replacement value of this property totals nearly 100 billion. Two thirds of this at risk property is concentrated in San Francisco Bay. Sea level rise, two thirds, 1.4 meter. But Exxon didn't, they, they love this. Exxon repeats this ad nauseum in their papers, but somehow, my former colleagues at Paul Weiss Rifkind, which is representing Exxon, I'm kind of ashamed that they did this, never included this, which is in fact the beginning of the risk of sea level changes and flood bond disclosure in those documents. Down there, you could, I'm sure the, sea level, the, uh, the slides will be distributed. Those are the page sites in those documents for where that can be found. I took the first, pulled the first three out. Um, and then decided, well, if the first three have this, uh, I, I'm not going to spend a lot more time looking through each one of these bond disclosure documents. In other words, um, Exxon's claims are pure bullshit. Um, okay, now, if this isn't enough, we can, who here thinks markets are efficient? No one? One, <laughs> oh, two, three? My God, I'm very surprised. Um, if markets are efficient and people think that the bond disclosure was not accurate, what do people do? They sell the bonds. Those are those three bonds. The maturity dates, the 2030s, that's the last maturity date, the longest out for each of those bonds. And what do you know? Uh, 
there's been no trading at all in two of those three bonds since disclosure happened months ago. And oh, the other one is trading at what appears to be the exact same price it was trading before this happened. And if we needed more evidence that no one thinks that this was um, improper or fraudulent or disingenuous, uh, my former adversaries in the plaintiff's securities bar, those people are extremely aggressive. The time lapse between bad news coming out and lawsuits followed by what were called the strike bar could be measured in you know one day, 48 hours, 72 hours, maybe four days, 96 hours. There have been no lawsuits filed against any of these cities for their bond disclosure. That should tell you something as well. <coughs> All right, well, that's the kind of basics here. Um, Exxon was bullshitting the court in Texas, uh, and you can imagine why uh, they're trying to do that. They, the exact same claims of a great conspiracy against Exxon were thrown out by uh, a federal judge in New York about three weeks ago, and then they were thrown out of the Supreme Court of Massachusetts uh, last week, um, it's an elaborate charade to intimidate other municipalities from bringing such cases, uh, which I'm glad to say has not uh, prevented my clients uh, uh, from filing their case today. And that's about it for me. Ah, well, David took less time than, than, it, than was allotted. Blessings upon you, my son. <laughs> uh, we'll turn now to Andrew Grossman from Baker Hostetler. Thank you, Ben. Um, why don't we start with uh, a little visualization exercise. Uh, it's a bit unusual. The Norwegian Sea is a cold and desolate body of water to the northeast, northwest rather, of Norway and adjacent to the Arctic Ocean. It is a in a particularly bleak corner of the Norwegian Sea, 93 miles due west of Norway, a concrete structure resembling a thumbtack juts out of the water, rising over 100 feet into the sky and breaking the otherwise uninterrupted gray horizon. This is the production platform of the Dragon oil field, operated by Norsk Shell, a subsidiary of Royal Dutch Shell. In engineering marvel, the Dragon platform's single piling plunges down 800 feet to the seafloor where it is surrounded by storage tanks, and they in turn are connected to a loading buoy used to transfer the oil to tankers. The oil is then transferred to a shore terminal and then to refineries in Norway, Sweden, or the Netherlands. The refined products are then sold into the European market. So my question for everyone is this. Whose law regulates the carbon emissions associated with the oil produced from Dragon? Um, this is a multiple choice question, so maybe, maybe we should do a show of hands. Um, you can choose more than one, that's fine. So A, Norway, because Dragon is in its exclusive economic zone. Anybody think Norway should re be regulating the uh, carbon emissions associated with that oil? No one, wow. What about Sweden? Because, you know, at least when the oil is refined there, that's, that's where it's refined. Uh, anybody favor Sweden? No, one, one vote for Sweden. How about the Netherlands? because that's where Royal Dutch Shell has its headquarters. So maybe the Netherlands would have some interest in this. Not a lot of interest in the Netherlands. How about the United Kingdom? Because that's where Shell's place of incorporation is. So maybe they would have some interest in what Shell is up to. Nobody? Nobody for the United Kingdom? Okay, fine. How about the European Union? Because, well, because it's the European Union and they regulate lots of things. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm going to assume that the laughter is a lot of votes for the European Union. Uh, final choice, how about the state of California? <laughs> yeah, I think that laughter is laughter for a reason. Because out of all of those, the state of California as an answer is insane. Um, and yet, there are a series of, at present, um, eight lawsuits uh, have, that have been brought by municipalities in the state of California arguing that California's nuisance law, in other words, the common law of the state of California, regulates the operations and the petroleum production of Royal Dutch Shell, including its operations on the Dragon oil field, uh, oil that is sold uh, and refined and processed uh, and, and, and used uh, in Europe. Um, 
Now, one can imagine a variety of uh, legal arguments that could be made against that proposition that the state of California's law would somehow reach across uh, the continents and the oceans uh, to regulate uh, that particular energy activity. Um, and we'll go through a few of them. Let me give you just a little bit of background on these lawsuits. The two that have gotten the most attention so far have been filed by San Francisco and Oakland. Um, there are an additional six filed by San Mateo County and a few other counties and cities around um, San Francisco as well, as well as Imperial Beach. New York City filed a similar lawsuit in January. Now, all of these uh, include public nuisance claims. In other words, a claim of interference with the right of the public. Um, typically, public nuisance claims are things like excessive noise from a factory that uh, troubles everybody uh, in a particular area. It might be industrial or agricultural odors, maybe air, even air and water pollution in some circumstances. The, the classic case is a concrete plant that blankets the neighborhood in the town with dust. A few of these claims also bring, a few of these cases rather, also bring trespass claims on the theory that rising oceans are entering places like San Mateo without their permission. Um, because of course, you need the permission of San Mateo before you're allowed within the county limits. Uh, I mean, maybe that's just me, but um, that is the legal theory. Now, none limit the conduct at issue uh, to that that's taken within the, their respective jurisdictions. In fact, to the contrary, they're quite open that they are challenging the worldwide uh, conduct, the worldwide energy production activities uh, of major oil firms, uh, fi uh, firms rather. And these really are just the latest in high-profile common law climate suits that have gone basically nowhere. You have, of course, AEP versus Connecticut, which died in the Supreme Court. And when I say died, that's not exactly right, because there were state common law uh, public nuisance claims that the parties, uh, the plaintiffs in that suit, subsequently dismissed on their own. There was Comer versus Mur Murphy Oil brought in Texas. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it brought, brought within the Fifth Circuit. There was Kivalina versus ExxonMobil. There's California versus General Motors. And currently, there are, about, there are pending right now something like a dozen fairly quixotic state lawsuits brought in the, name of in the names of children, arguing if the states have a common law, or in some cases, a constitutional duty to adopt particular emissions policies under the so-called public trust doctrine. Several of those cases, little surprise, have already been dismissed. Now, activists are very keen to bring these suits. Some donors are eager, eager to fund them, and some politicians believe that it's in their political interest to participate. For a lot of these people, the idea is that the idea of total and complete victory if that is just one lawsuit around the corner, well, that's irresistible. And it's obviously more appealing than having to work through the political process. Legislation involves incremental, incremental change, and it requires having to cut deals with people who disagree with you and are therefore obviously wrong and obviously oppose science, deny climate, and probably are in the pocket of big oil or something like that. Anyway, so they bring the lawsuits. And the history, at least so far, doesn't really suggest that there's much merit to any of them. Still, there are strong incentives to go to court, even when a loss is the likely outcome. And I think there are some indications that that same phenomenon is at play here. For one, there is the sheer audacity of the claims, this idea that California law somehow reaches halfway around the world to control what other sovereign states are doing uh, to activities uh, within their borders. Um, that's a little bit audacious, audacious as a legal matter. For another, there's the kind of overheated rhetoric that is more common to plaintiff's attorneys and activists than the government attorneys who are, who, who, in whose names these suits are often being brought. And then there is, in some instances, exaggeration. Now, David discussed uh, some of the uh, bond disclosures at issue here. I'm not a securities attorney. I'm not qualified to go through and vet these things and tell you as a legal matter whether the, whether the disclosures were appropriate and adequate and whether there might be a basis for a securities lawsuit or not. What I can say is that if you just look at the plain text of them, there's obviously some tension between the language in some of the bond disclosures versus the language and the certainty that's reflected in these lawsuits, particularly regarding things like causation, um, as well as involving the magnitude of particular injuries and the timelines for those injuries. Now, there's a tension. There might even be an outright conflict. Um, those are difficult and complicated questions. Fortunately, we might actually get an answer to some of those questions. Um, you know, the good public-minded citizens at the Competitive Enterprise Institute have filed a complaint, uh, I'm sorry, a, 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 an investigative referral to the Securities and Exchange Commission asking it to investigate possible securities fraud. So for now, 
We can say that there may be some tension there, but if there is uh, any real disagreement, presumably the Securities and Exchange Commission will either identify that or will confirm that there is nothing to be concerned about in that respect. But I think there is another indication that this is a publicity stunt, and that's the allegations that the energy conspiracy was involved in some kind of conspiracy to hide the truth about climate change. Now, what we're talking about here in the main are public nuisance claims. Like I said, things like uh, excessive noise. I guess in this instance, it's, it's literally climate change. That, that is what the public nuisance uh, is alleged to be. Now, what does hiding a, what does a, an alleged conspiracy to hide the truth about climate change over a period of years have to do with the nuisance claims? Well, if you look at state common law, uh, uh, co the common law of nuisance, the answer is not much. But it is irresistible to make that kind of argument for activists and for trial attorneys because it lets them paint the energy industry as the next tobacco. Um, and of course, that's what plaintiffs' attorneys and activists have been saying about every industry to come down the road for the past 20 years. It's the next tobacco, they're the next public evil, uh, evil industry and evil corporation, and it's the, these, this is the next round of groundbreaking cases that are going to end with a multi-billion dollar settlement. Well, so far that's happened once with tobacco. And I did a little search. You can go onto Westlaw. You can search for yourself. You can go into LexisNexis. People have been calling climate change and the fossil fuel industry the next tobacco for about the past 23 years. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but maybe these cases will be the ones that finally bring that across the finish line. It seems unlikely to me. Um, then, if you want to talk about exaggeration and conspiracy mongering, um, you really only need to look at several of these complaints. I would direct your attention to paragraph 67 of the Oakland complaint, and it's paragraph 68 of the San Francisco complaint. It refers to some kind of secret industry document as evidence of a conspiracy to hide the truth about climate change from the public. Now, as the judge overseeing uh, hearing those cases put it, quote, I read paragraph 67 as saying that there was a conspiratorial document within the defendants about how they knew good and well that global warming was right around the corner. He continued, okay. That's going to be a big thing, I want to see it. Well, it turned out it wasn't quite that. What it was was a slideshow that somebody had gone to the IPCC, that is the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and was reporting on what the IPCC had reported, and that was it. Nothing more. So they were on notice of what an IPP said from that document, but it's hard to say that they were secretly aware. By that point, they knew. Everybody knew everything in the IPCC. Now, after that hearing, Oakland, to its credit, amended its complaint. But the paragraph is still there. They just added a sentence on how the industry group that came up with this document, quote, questioned several of the conclusions of the IPCC, which, so far as I'm aware, is still a legal thing to do in this country. Um, but maybe I'm wrong about that, and maybe this lawsuit will find the contrary. Now, what is the likely outcome of these lawsuits? Now, I could sit here and I could give you about a dozen arguments as to why I think there are legal problems with it, but I won't bore you with that. I'm just going to hit a couple high points of, I think, about three of them uh, that, that, that I think are probably the most uh, compelling. The principal argument is simply that uh, state action in this area, common law in this area, has been displaced by Congress. Now, effectively, the Supreme Court held as much in AEP versus Connecticut in 2011. The court recognized that the Clean Air Act speaks directly to carbon emissions, thereby leaving no room for federal common law. Um, interestingly enough, a number of the attorneys who were involved in the, um, in the litigation that prompted the court to reach that holding, Massachusetts versus EPA, are now involved in this current round of litigation. Um, perhaps they should go and consider their previous cases. But even, and, and the court continued further that even if the EPA does not regulate particular emissions at all, in other words, in carbon emissions from particular sources or doesn't do it enough or anything of that sort, the proper remedy is to petition the agency to do so and to challenge that, in other words, to challenge its response, not to bring a tort lawsuit because the tort lawsuits are displaced. Notably, as I mentioned earlier, after the Supreme Court decided that the federal claims were displaced, the plaintiffs proceeded to dismiss their identical state public, uh, state public nuisance claims. 
Now, as the municipalities in these cases, in the current cases, appear to try to distinguish AEP on two grounds. One is that they aren't challenging direct emissions. In other words, they aren't challenging uh, the cars that are burning the fossil fuel and putting the carbon dioxide. They aren't challenging the power plants uh, that are burning um, fossil fuels and you know, emitting the carbon dioxide. They are instead challenging the oil companies and the energy companies that are putting fossil fuels into the flow of commerce. Andrew? Yes. Five minutes. Thank you. Now, as a lawyer, my view is that it's too clever by half. Um, the alleged industry, injury here is still caused by the emissions, and those, of course, can't be challenged. If it weren't for the emissions, there wouldn't be the injury and there wouldn't be the lawsuit. Seems pretty straightforward. The second ground that they attempt to distinguish this is that they're talking about state nuisance law rather than federal nuisance law, as was at issue in AEP. But the Supreme Court has held in something like a dozen cases that common law actions involving interstate and international disputes are necessarily governed by federal law and has repeatedly cited interstate pollution as the quintessential example of that type of claim that is exclusively governed by federal law. It's hard to see why these cases would be any different. And indeed, that's what Judge Alsop held in California in the uh, San Francisco and Oakland cases. The second reason why I think there's a problem with these lawsuits is that the conduct here is authorized by law, and conduct that's authorized by law is not a nuisance. Um, the federal government leases lands for energy development and production. It subsidizes energy production in like dozens of ways. It regulates the extraction, production, sale, and use of fossil fuels in hundreds of different ways. These activities in and of themselves are not nuisances. Now, they could be conducted in a way that's a nuisance. In other words, somebody could uh, have a drilling platform that um, creates a lot of noise and disturbs people. Fine, maybe that's a nuisance, but that's not what's being challenged here. What's being challenged here is the energy development activity itself, and that's something that the federal government closely regulates and sanctions. Now, federal law not only authorizes that, but it encourages the production of fossil fuels. Congress has said in numerous statutes that it is the policy of the United States to promote domestic oil and gas production, to increase domestic production so as to decrease foreign energy dependence, to increase development of energy resources on federal lands and to increase recovery of fossil fuels from existing sources. None of these activities are things that are nuisances. These are the things that our government, that Congress has decided that as a country, as a matter of governmental policy, we promote. Fundamentally, I think the biggest problem with these lawsuits is the separation of powers. Um, there is simply no ability for a federal court to create a national climate policy. But that's what they're being asked to do. In fact, they're not being asked to create a national climate policy. They're being asked to create a global one. Simply imagine the foreign policy implications. Now, I mean, it implicates things like conventions, international agreements, diplomatic relations. Is a US court supposed to tell Norway what to do with the energy producers like Shell within its own borders, the ones that it regulates? Does the court take into account what Norway is already doing? How does it do that? I don't know. Do you ask Norway, does the judge ask Norway what it thinks about all of this? Do you have to have a bilateral summit between the, I guess, the federal district court judge and the Norwegian ambassador? Now, what if Norway threatens trade sanctions in response to whatever it is the federal judge decides to do? Does the court hold Norway in contempt? I, I don't know. I don't even know how you would begin answering those questions. But let's even go closer to home. What about Texas? What if Texas disagrees that energy development within its own state is any kind of nuisance at all? After all, a lot of energy development and production uh, that takes place in Texas takes place on public lands that are owned by the states of, state of Texas that it leases for energy production. <clears throat> what does the state of California do about that? What does it have to tell the state of Texas? Um, about its own law and how that regulates the state of Texas? And how on earth does a federal court attempt to enforce California law against the state of Texas? Again, I don't know. Maybe federal law would provide some basis. California law certainly wouldn't. Andrew, two minutes. Thank you. Now, I, I think what I'm getting at is that these lawsuits implicate the kind of policy decisions that can only be made by the political branches. What's the right target for atmospheric CO2 concentrations? How do you get there once you've decided on the target? How do you benefit, how do you balance the benefits of fossil fuel production versus the risks of climate change? What are the costs? 
They can vary enormously depending on how you identify and model the policy response to climate change. If you put more attention on mitigation, maybe the costs are lower in the future. Those are policy choices. Now let's say that you could somehow arrive at a number that you think ought to be paid as either damages or a substitute for abatement or something like that, whatever it is that the plaintiffs in these lawsuits are asking for. It's money of some sort. How do you apportion that? Why would it just be the energy producers? Why wouldn't it be the emitters? Aren't they involved in this somehow? Why not the auto companies? Why not the airlines? Why not electric utilities too? They're presumably responsible for some of this. Why not the users of fossil fuel products? For example, the people who drive cars, the people who fly in airplanes, the people who plug their cell phones in at night. There really isn't any limiting principle and there really isn't any answer to any of these questions. Again, I don't know how a court would begin to decide them. So with that, I'll conclude. I think I've made it within my 15 minutes. Uh, but I think the point stands that we've had a lot of these lawsuits. We've had very strong claims made at the outset of them. We've had press conferences. We've had claims that this will be finally the lawsuit that totally upends uh, energy production and traditional sources of energy. Well, if it were me, I probably wouldn't bet on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank ben, you, Andrew. Ben, yeah, thank I, you, Andrew. I have a question. I, I, since I'm now involved in these cases, uh, I thought the panel was just about the issue of the bond disclosures as opposed to the merits of the cases. Well, the, the, the event is about whatever people want to talk about within okay. the context of the litigation uh, and the disclosures or non-disclosures uh, in, in, the, in the bond disclosures. You're going to have plenty of time. Oh. To, I'm sure I will. Uh, let's see. Uh, Andrew, indeed you did make it just under the 15-minute wire, but you received fewer blessings than was the case for, uh, for David. Uh, okay. Uh, Mike uh, McCracken from the Climate Institute, um, take it away. Um, and you, are, you, are present, you have slides. Are they? Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll, hopefully we'll get them going. So, uh, Thank you very much. Um, I'm very different. I'm a scientist here. I'm going to basically talk about why the problem is arising, why there's this issue of concern. There is then the question of uh, what to be doing about it. Um, so I want to just uh, start with my conclusions. Hopefully we'll get through all the slides, but we'll, we'll see. And, and that is basically that observations are already showing. Observations are showing, so this isn't modeling that there's already an increasing indication of, of occurrence of extremes of a lot of different kinds. And it, this is just going to continue to occur uh, and intensify as climate changes. And I want to sort of try to explain the basic reason for why that is the case. And then we can talk about, I mean, this panel can be about what you might do about it or something like that. So just as kinds of indications, the number of record warm days occurring is more than uh, cold days. The, if you go back to a particular uh, period of time, you see that you start exceeding records across the country in particular months. Not all months do that. They vary. As you go for precipitation, the, the intensity of precipitation is going up sharply. You're getting more of the rain coming in, heavy rainfall events. And that's something that's been observed for, throughout the 20th century on essentially all of the continents except Antarctica. So we're sort of seeing these kinds of, of long-term trends. Um, so I want to actually make sure we're clear on definitions at the start as we go, because there's a lot of times where the, the things just aren't being said in, the, in a way that's precise enough for scientists to really like. So weather is the instantaneous state of the atmosphere. It's what's happening now, um, and it includes sort of all the variables. Weather forecast models try and start with a set of conditions, now or something, and try and predict into the future exactly what's going to happen to the instantaneous state of the atmosphere. So we use the word predict when we're talking about what we do with weather forecasts. It's something that's, that's determined by what, what the situation is now. Current weather forecast models, um, they've been improving over time. They now get, they have some sort of useful skill out to a week to two weeks. Um, useful meaning it's, you get a better estimate out of the models than assuming either the thing's going to stay exactly the same or that you're going to get to the average condition for what the weather might be like. So 
uh, this has to do with tracks of large systems. If you, if you go, talk about climate, though, climate is something different. Climate is the statistical aggregation of all the weather over a period of time. It's typically 30 years, so you get past this variability. And so it isn't just the average, but it's the range of conditions that exist, the fluctuations that exist. Sometimes the natural influences like El Nino and La Nina or sunspot cycles or modest volcanic eruptions or something, but you look over a, a few decade period at what, what's happening, and we sort of believe that period is determined by the external forcings that are affecting the climate. So what climate models try and do is start from sort of the uh, typical conditions of a period, and most of the runs that are run for climate uh, simulations that start in the eight, in 1850s or something. They sort of take a typical condition from that and then try and project ahead. You're not trying to predict the instantaneous state of the weather, but you're trying to make a prediction that evolves sort of like the weather would, and then when you put the statistics together, the evolution of those statistical distributions changes in time, and we think that's, that can be determined pretty well. Um, if you look at um, how climate models are doing, um, one thing you can do is run climate models one way and another way. And so on the left figure, the bluish sort of shaded area is what happens if you start, in this case, in 1880, and you're sort of running along with just natural forcings, just the sun varying as based on as best we can estimate the measurements, uh, volcanic eruptions and other things, the large dips to the downside or times of volcanic eruptions. Um, and so you get a band, you get a distribution of things. Now the actual record is what's uh, happening in the, whichever curve it is there, the observed, the one rising, the ones rising up out on the, on the right hand side of that left figure. But so, so the natural climate without human influences would be sort of relatively constant global average temperature. When you, uh, but, it, but that doesn't, when you do that, it doesn't represent what's actually happening in the observations, the warming over the latter half of the 20th century and up to the present. If on the other hand, you include human influences, greenhouse gases and aerosols and, and things as best we know, you get the band and, and the observations end up in this band of what the models are projecting. They basically are getting some variability and you have a, a distribution that they're trying to represent. And there's no other way, there's no other explanation for this happening. And if you're in statistics, these are statistical variations that would be four or five sigma. I mean, you just don't have, this wouldn't happen as a random kind of situation. Something is causing this to happen. Um, and human influences turn out to be the only way. We, we look at various ways considering natural influences and they just wouldn't look that way. And there's a whole host of other indicators that are changing. Glaciers are melting back, snow cover is going down, humidity, absolute humidity, amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is going up. There are a whole bunch of things that are happening that confirm it. So now how do we look at this issue of extreme events? What's going to happen? There's sort of two ways to do it. One is to look at the statistics of what's happening. So look at, are the statistics changing over time? Does the distribution of climate in the mid 20th century look different than what it would look like now? And the other is to run models. So you run models with and without human influences and you see how you get after you run a lot of model simulations and statistics. I'm gonna talk just about the first part, about observations. I'm not gonna go into the the issue of what happens when you do models, they confirm the same result, so it's best just to, let's just look at observations. So let me just say that when you look at observations, if you look at temperature and you get a district, you will find you have some days that are a little warmer than normal, some are a little colder than normal, most are right around the center, and this sort of normal distribution, how a drunkard would walk or how uh, what the distribution of heights would be in this room if you looked at it. You'd, you'd sort of have that kind of distribution. Most are around the center average, um, sort of called one sigma, including uh, two-thirds of, essentially two-thirds of the things. And what's out on the extremes, you have, okay, a few very tall people, a few very short people or something like that, and a few very hot years, a few very cold years. So Jim Hansen did, and his colleagues did a very interesting thing. They said, well, let's look at temperature, summer temperature anomalies on land areas around the world, and we're going to try and sort of 
compare these cases. Each one has its own set of variability, but we'll sort of normalize it on this, the sigma framework, which includes the sort of central two-thirds. But he created the, this curve, and you get this sort of bell-shaped curve. And this happens in all kinds of things. If you were to look at sea level rise on some things, if you were to look at all kinds of different things happen. Uh, it's colored here with one-third being red, one-third being blue, and a center third that's sort of the, the normal thing. And, and what the issue is as we face things is it, that's the kind of curve that was used for planning much of the infrastructure built in the United States after World War II. So I want to avoid a one in a hundred year flood. Okay, what do I do? I find out what the distribution is of this kind of thing. I figure out where the probability is for one in a hundred years and I design for that. And so I'm going to be out there at between two and three sigma if I, if I do that. I'm going to build for that kind of condition. Or if I'm going to design a building for air conditioning load, I'm going to try and protect against some temperature record. I'm going to do the same thing. And so a lot of our infrastructure has been based on that. That was it. That's in the fundamental way that civil engineers are told to design things. Look at the past, get the distribution, design things that way. Um, so what happens if you then go and to a later period? So let's go to the next decade after that. Well, gee, if I keep that bell-shaped curve from the 50s, which is sort of 50 to 80 as the baseline, I'm getting more occurrence of the warm kind of years, fewer of the cool years. So I go then to the 1990s. Okay, I'm getting more warm. It's more likely, much more likely to get warm than it is to get cool. And then I go, uh, which they did in their first paper on it, and I go to the first decade of this century. Now, two th instead of 30% of the summers or locations that are having these variations um, being warmer on the warm side, now two-thirds are having those kind of conditions, and you're having a much lower fraction of the cool times. Um, and if you uh, actually look at the very warm conditions, so what's out beyond what was originally a one in a thousand situation, those kind of warm periods are occurring about 10% of the time. Okay, so people wonder, well, I have a 100-year flood, but now I'm having two of them in the same year or two storms. In the year. This is what's happening. You're getting a much more occurrence of what used to be extremes if you look on the past. Now, if you were to update your statistics every 10 years the way NOAA does and only consider three decade periods, then you're going to keep having, compared to that, I'm going to have warm years and cool years and it'll still be that third, <coughs> broken up in thirds. But if you go back to the baseline where fundamental things were built, the heights of cities above, and airports above sea level, the, uh, designs of all kinds of dams and a bunch of other things uh, for rain events, what you're having as you rise past those fixed heights of beaches or whatever is a, a really disproportionate change and increase in the incidence of extreme events. And that's going to happen. This is what's happened in the, uh, if we add on, sort of go 2005 to 15, sort of now we're having, instead of one case in 1,000, you're having it be 145 cases in 1,000. OK, now I can't say any of those particular summers was uh, you know, caused absolutely by, by human activities. But if 145, 144 out of the 145 are being caused because we've shifted the curve, or before in that uh, from 10 percent, if, uh, if before when it was 1 in 1,000 and now it's 10 percent, that's saying 99 out of 100 are sort of due to human activities. It's, it's sort of like if you were, had a pot of water on the stove and you had it turned up just so it was barely simmering and every once in a while you got a bubble. Okay, that's what's happening. Now I have a fixed boundary, the boiling point, I add heat, what happens? I get a lot more bubbles. I can't say that every, that bubble was absolutely caused by turning up the heat. But if I have 100 bubbles and I only had one before, that's a statistical inference about what's happening. So uh, if you look at this, this is looking at it sort of for different months of the year in different ways. If you look on the left curve, it's recognizing the different temperature of the seasons and every month's moving over. If you look on the right curve, that's sort of aligning them to see that all the months are doing it and those little boxes are what's happening in more recent years from that graph. This is the kind of thing that's happening in precipitation. We're sort of getting more heavy precipitation events around the country. 
Um, so what about sea level? Sea level have been going on for a couple of thousand years at relatively level, going up a little and down a little, not much. Uh, and so now we're headed on the, if you look at the left graph on the right-hand side of the left graph, we're started heading up. Okay, now I go over to the right-hand graph. That right-hand graph is a factor of 10 vertical scale compared to the left-hand graph. Okay, so we're starting to go up, and that's the projections of what's going to happen with sea level rise from just heating the water. It takes up more space. Melting glaciers puts more water in the ocean. Melting the ice sheets puts more water in the ocean. We have a lot of very low land around where inundation is going to occur. They have different situations. They have different abilities to protect. Some are very valuable property like New York, and they're going to do some protection. Some isn't, and you're going to have to retreat. Uh, there's very different things that can happen. This looks like a complicated graph, but I, I want to get to this issue for the bond uh, people. So there, the question is, how long have they really been talking about this as a risk, and how long should they have known it's happening? This sort of goes through assessments for the last 40 years or so, almost 35 years, and it talks about where things are coming from. And what turns out from all of this, don't try and really read the numbers, but um, is that most of the terms are the same, and the big question is what's going to happen to Antarctica? Okay, and so if you look at the IPCC assessments through the 90s and even into the 2000, early 2000s assessments, they were all saying not much is going to happen with Antarctica. It might even get some more snow on it and yeah. pull sea level down. Might, yeah. uh, and, and might pull sea level down a bit. But what's happening is we're observing that it's starting to lose mass rapidly, it's becoming unstable. Scientists just were very, very cautious on what was going to happen. Uh, we know from 20,000 years ago, the last glacial sea level was down 120 meters, 400 feet, when the global average temperature was down maybe 5 or 6 degrees Celsius. That's like 20 meters per degree at equilibrium. If you look at present getting warmer, if you were to go back in Earth history tens of millions of years ago when it was 4 or 5 degrees warmer, there was no polar ice sheets. Uh, in Greenland and Antarctica. That's 70 meters of sea level equipment. So there's plenty of potential for a lot more to occur. So I, I, I would say there's all kinds of complications. We could talk for hours about complications. Why we have it cold now when it's warming. Why there's more lake effect snow. Because the lakes are open because it's warmer. Cold air comes over it. I mean, there's all sorts of questions and nuances. And scientists are working and putting out reports all year I mean, each year summarizing their kinds of things. So basically what we're faced with overall is a situation where the trends in the observations and analyses of situations and the model simulations are all giving a clear indication that this bell-shaped curve is sliding over. And as that happens, you get a greater frequency and intensity of <clears throat> all considered extreme events and for which much of our infrastructure is designed. Um, and so you have these problems. So we're just going to see an increasing set of these kind of conditions occurring. And ultimately, if you trace back to it, that's, the shift is occurring because of human activity. So that's the situation that we face. OK, thanks, thanks Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, Pat, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is a laser pointer here on red. I guess. I have no idea. Nope, it's your, it's your slides. Um, can I, where's my slide deck? Try, try hitting the green button. Hit, hit. Oh, that'll show some more of mine. That's good. No. Can you go, may, maybe go to the end of yours? <laughs> Just two more. Just go. Okay. There, there we go. go. All right, thank you very much. One more. <clears throat> I took the, the title of this gathering somewhat literally uh, it says uh, basically what did they know and when did they know it? And I thought I'd examine that a little bit. I can't paint quite as rosy a picture uh, of the science uh, as my colleague Mike McCracken, uh, but I will say this. Uh, Mike is correct. You have to have some type of model for the future. You could, you could base a future model on past performance, but the boundary conditions will be different because there's more carbon dioxide in the air than there was. Uh, 
You can take a look at temperature differences between ice ages when the carbon dioxide bounced around a little bit, but you have a much larger range of bounce. So it is a modeling problem. And all the consequences that are described and uh, alluded to in these legal proceedings are model-based. So I'd like to say, what did they know and when did they know it? We didn't know very much back when this started, when Manabe and Weatherald published their sig signal paper in the late 1970s. If you read the fine print, it said, uh, our model actually goes into an ice age, so we raised the solar constant about uh, 30 or 40 watts per meter squared. In other words, they moved the Earth two million miles closer to the sun. Uh, there has been less candor about what's called the parameterization of these models, but it is starting to come out now. Anyway, I'd just like to emphasize that all attribution must be model-based. Where's the laser on this thing? No, oh, I guess there's no laser on it. I'm all sorry. right, well, I'll just read off this. Any attribution has to be model-based. Mike uh, did go into that. But the model versus observed behavior <coughs> is simply not encouraging. I'm going to show you here all 35 families of models uh, in the latest IPCC report uh, for the lower troposphere, that's the active layer, or, or middle troposphere, that's part of the active layer of the atmosphere, down to the surface and up to the stratosphere. Let's take a look at the average of the whole region. Ah, this is all very interesting. The red line is the average of all the climate, 32 groups of climate models running back to 1979. The blue squares are uh, the satellite data sets. There are three of them. The purple diamonds are a new data set that people are kind of getting very excited about called reanalysis data. We take, uh, we take the observed temperatures and fill in the blanks. There are blanks on the planet, not with simply statistical Krieging or something like that, but with a dynamic model. And it very much uh, Im imitates what's going on in the weather balloons, which are the green. Now, each piece of colored spaghetti is a model group average. Note something. There's a substantial divergence between the larger family of models and what's being observed, and it is not small. Howsoever, there's one model that does work. It's INMCM4. Boy, you know, call up the conspiracy people because it's the Russian model. Uh, <coughs> Now, when you teach weather forecasting, uh, and I, I did at UVA, one of the things you tell students is, which model, which model or set of models are you going to use today? Well, you look and see which models work the best. Or you look and see which model worked the best the last time the synoptic situation uh, it was what this one is. In this case, you'd use INMCM4 with maybe slight weighting on all the others. Now I'm going to show you my complicated, boring graph. This should put you to sleep, but actually it's sort of the meat of this little discussion. First of all, uh, I went the wrong way. There we go. Uh, this is a graph in the vertical. And uh, each one of the models is a piece of colored spaghetti. As you can see, um, they all predict much more warming than is being observed as you ascend through the atmosphere. The left-hand dots are the, uh, the upper air data for different levels from the surface, which is given as 10,000 10, pascals, uh, up to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 100,000, up to 10,000, which is about 45, 50,000 feet in the atmosphere. You can see that the models all predict a huge amount of heating, particularly as you get up there around 30,000, 40,000. What model works? Which one is actually tracking it? Aha! Look in the color, color on the right. It is INMCM4. What do we do to make our assessments of future climate and future climate impacts? Do we weight heavily on INMCM4? No! We take the larger distribution of models. So we're basing our projections on a known error that is systematic in the modeling field. That's not good. Uh, now, I'd just like to get to the present for a second because the, all these models end in kind of a warm, uh, warm recent period. It has to do mainly with the, the 
2016 El Nino. And by the way, parenthetically, it's a greenhouse warming, okay? Greenhouse theory predicts that while lower atmospheric temperatures rise, stratospheric temperatures decline. There's a reason for that, because the flux of infrared radiation is essentially trapped more in the lower atmosphere, so there's less passing through the stratosphere. And take a look at the satellite record for the lower troposphere, lower stratosphere, rather, and you can see it. It's going down. This is a difficult prediction in global warming theory. Karl Popper loves this kind of stuff. What's also cool about it is beginning in the late 1990s, the cooling of the stratosphere appears to stop or really, really, really slow down. The same time there was the so-called pause in surface temperature, uh, which has been somewhat adjusted away, I think the adjustments must be slightly suspect because if the stratosphere is not cooling at the same rate, the surface isn't warming at the same rate. Anyway, so now let's uh, talk about the recent era. This is the latest version of the climate research unit temperature record. Uh, it's the one I think scientists tend to cite the most. You can see, uh, if you look from around 2001 to mid-2014, that's flat. So something funny was going on with this. And then you can see the run-up to the big El Nino in 2016 and the fall off back to pretty much where it was. Um, so we're not going to see nearly as much recently. This is my favorite data set. Ryan Maui did this for me. Uh, this is a commercial for Ryan Maui. He's the next young star in climate world, uh, in my estimation. Uh, this is the reanalysis data, and it goes through uh, April 11th of this year. You can see the El Nino, and you can see the decline after the end of the El Nino, which looks pretty much like it was somewhere around 19, uh, 2014 or 2015. If that keeps up, we're going to get us another pause. I'm not predicting that. And here's the satellite record uh, for the uh, lower atmosphere. Uh, again, you can see the 1998 El Nino and the 2016. They were both big. Uh, those recent months, where it ends there, March 2018, back for about eight or ten months, they look an awful lot like the months between 2002 and 2005, 6, 7. So... I'm not saying we're going to go back there. I suspect we'll settle a little above that, but uh, the biasing effect of the recent El Nino is rather large. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about extreme events because extreme events gather people's attention. Uh, in the last report, still the operative report, the U.S. National Climate Assessment, there was a, a, lot, of, a lot of talk of hurricanes, and uh, it talked about the period 19, uh, don't see, that's not coming, I can't see my graph, huh, wait a minute, yeah, uh, 1970 through, through 2009, and uh, the red line through the data was what you were supposed to see. Well, in fact, the hurricane density, power density can be calculated all the way back to 1920, you might say, well, the records aren't as reliable. You're right. The big ones are going to get missed. So what's happening in the early part of the 20th century is it's probably an underestimate. And you can see that the behavior in the mid-century, early mid-century uh, of the hurricane power in the Atlantic is pretty similar to what it was. That report ended in 2009, even though the data was available through 2013 when it was published. If you put in 10, 11, 12, 13, you will see that it would have wound up on the bottom. Don't know why that happened. Obviously, an innocent omission. Uh, other things people notice are Category 3, 4, and 5 tornadoes. They don't get missed. You don't need radar to see a 3, 4, or a 5. Uh, and uh, this is the, the record of them. There is a significant decline. I think it's a statistical fluke and probably meaningless. But looking at tornadoes, everybody loves tornadoes. All the uh, uh, attention they get. I mean, not, you, know, you don't love one when you're in one, I can tell you that. Uh, shows how we adapt to the vagaries of weather and climate. The United States is the tornado capital of the world, followed by Australia, and oddly enough, followed, I believe, by Italy. Take a look at death statistics for tornadoes, and you can see this wonderful example of adaptation. You have more people living in the way of bad weather 
And all of a sudden, around the mid-1950s, the deaths begin to drop. Why? Because in 1953, there were three urban tornadoes. Uh, it was Worcester, Massachusetts, a place not known for tornadoes, Waco, Texas, and I forget where the third one, Flint, Michigan. And so David Atlas from the University of Chicago came to Washington and said, we can track these things. We can issue warnings if you will let us put out radar scopes around the country. And that is what you're seeing. That is the adaptation. Similarly, as heat waves become more frequent in urban areas, and they do with or without global warming, in the United States, the mortality from heat waves drops because people get used to them and they adapt. Similarly, in France, the 2003 heat wave killed a ton of people, many more than it should have, given the heat. The next one came along in 2006, and by then they had adapted, and it resulted in many fewer fatalities. Let's just take a look at the effects of what I would call the disparity between the vertical distribution of the atmosphere that's forecast and what's being observed. Let's see how we're adapting and what all that does. This is from Roger Pilkey, Jr. Billion dollar weather disasters as percent of GDP. I could go online and find all kinds of statements that more weather related damages will, after you adjust, in, when you, you use the GDP, you're inherently adjusting for population density and property values. If you explicitly adjust, you get the same answer. So the conclusion of my talk is what did we know? Not very much. What then? What did ExxonMobil know then? Not very much. What do we know now? Not very much. That vertical, the vertical error in the models is so severe as to invalidate almost all the subsequent out, output. You know why? That determines the vertical distribution of temperature in the tropics determines the buoyancy of the air. And vast amount of the Earth's atmospheric moisture is injected in the tropics. So all the subsequent forecasts, rain, et cetera, et cetera, are invalid, and that messes up the daily energy balance. It's a mess. What do we know? Not very much, and less than we, less than we knew, less than we thought we knew when the models first came out. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pat. Uh, we have Steve Winterstein from uh, Wilmington Associates talk about the Muni bond market. Wow. So let me recap for you. <clears throat> Pat just told us that we don't know much and that the models that we're going to use going forward, uh, the models that we're using going forward, the averages are completely wrong and we know that they're wrong. Mike told us that um, we're definitely in a rising uh, temperature, uh, climate, uh, climate uh, warming, and that at least to some extent man is responsible. Andrew told us, well, if there is causality, we don't know how to apportion it correctly, and if we do know how to apportion it, how do we uh, enforce any kind of ruling? I think I've captured it so far, haven't I? <laughs> and David told us that, um, that the uh, alleged contradictions in the bond disclosures and the claims of uh, Rule 202 petition by ExxonMobil, uh, really there are no discrepancies that uh, we didn't hear the whole story. Do, do I have that right, David? Uh, I think I used Part the word it. bullshit. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, you got so it right. Is that, is that a technical term? Uh, yes, it is. I'm just going to say wrong. <laughs> so the courts are going to decide. There, there's obviously disagreement between... Um, the claims of uh, that ExxonMobil is making and and the the cities and and I think there's a county uh, two counties thrown in in the California cases uh, and the courts are going to decide that what I'm here to talk about is the importance of what it all means to the municipal bond market and um, how we should be viewing it as investors as institutional investors and uh, I hope uh, you can take a little bit away from from my comments. Look, institutional investors, uh, you know, I, I should start by saying that um, my comments are my opinions only and not necessarily those of Wilmington Trust, nor uh, industry associations uh, like the National Federation of Municipal Analysts or its constituent societies. There, I got that out of the way. I think just in the nick of time, by the way. Um, so dis disclosure is really, really important. It's important to institutional investors, and it's important to the regulators. It's important to lawmakers. Uh, 
And uh, the municipal market, I dare say, is one bastion of the, the domestic capital markets where that has been a, a, a pressing issue for a very long time. I'm just going to throw a couple statistics out, uh, and I apologize for this. There are, unlike in the corporate bond markets, in the equity markets, there are 80,000 individual state and local governments in the United States. Of those 80,000, 65,000 of them issue pub in the public debt markets. You, I know it sounds, okay, trivial, but uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. And uh, there are over one and a half million individual bonds that, that are out, outstanding in the market. The one thing that I kind of, um, it, not laugh, that's not the right word, but I, I, I kind of um, chuckle to myself, I guess, when David brought up the, the, the bonds and their trading prices, uh, just to lend some perspective, uh, our market only trades 25 basis points per day of the entire uh, municipal bond market. So it's a $3.8 trillion market, only about 11, 12 billion on average trades every day. So it's not unusual. When I saw those statistics, I, I, that, that was interesting, but it certainly didn't, uh, it, it wasn't puzzling to me, uh, knowing that, oh, by the way, it's a different 25 basis points of the market, a quarter of a percent of issuers that transact each day. So there's a rolling, uh, there's a rolling uh, uh, trade history, if you will, in, in the market. Um, so what do, what do I want to do? I, I want to make three points, and I'm going to be pretty quick with this, and I'm going to try to keep it conversational. Uh, the first point that I want to make is, Irrespective of, of what the merits of the, um, the uh, Rule 202 petition or the claims that the, the municipalities are, are making, and whether the disclosures are consistent, whether they're contradictory or not, I think it's important to, to note that this isn't a free shot on goal. So for municipalities to sign up, for this kind of a lawsuit, understand something. You know, an, a lawyer comes into your office, he says, look, we're going to file, you know, a lawsuit against big oil, and all you got to do is sign here, and I'll talk to you on, on settlement date. Um, that apparently, um, as, as history is proving, uh, isn't the case. So now there are, um, there are appeals, there are uh, depositions to be had. This is going to cost, uh, cost the, the local governments uh, real dollars. Uh, is it going to break the bank? No, I don't think it's going to break the bank, but it's certainly not free. But there's another kind of cost, and that's reputational cost. If the courts do find that there was a problem with disclosures, if they find that, that um, in fact, the, the, the uh, claims of the 202 filing were legitimate, then you have reputational risk involved as well. And that is that, um, that, that um, they weren't being forthright, the, the, the state and local governments weren't being forthright in their, in their disclosures. That leads me to my second point. So that's my first point. It's not free anymore. My second point is this that we as institutional investors in the marketplace, we rely on these disclosures much more than most individual investors realize. That is our legal document that claims our security, that, claim, that, that discloses material events. Th this, is, this is our guidepost. This is our map as to whether this, this credit is, is a secure credit, whether the claims that are being made in the document are truthful or not. When we have contradictions, if there are apparent contradictions, I'm not saying there are in these lawsuits or not. Uh, the courts are going to decide that. And you've heard, uh, you've heard David's uh, claims. I've heard uh, other claims. Uh, and, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, and the court's going to decide on it, or there's going to be a settlement made. But to be sure, we rely on these, we rely on these uh, claims uh, as, as, um, as gospel, if you will. Why is that important? Well, um, and... and Forgive me, I've got to refer to my notes here. Um, last year, uh, actually just in October, uh, Dr. Uh, Christine Cuny and uh, Svenja Dubé of, and I'm sure I just butchered that last name and I apologize uh, to the authors, but um, from, NY, from NYU, they, they, um, they produced a working paper uh, through Brookings. Uh, it's called When Transparency Pays, The Moderating Effects of Disclosure Quality Changes in the Cost of Debt. Um, this is something that we've known all along in our markets, but there, there's some academic rigor around it. And what it tells us is this, and, and I won't bore you with the, uh, 
the, the, the details. What I will tell you is that the authors have found that there is a significant relationship, positive relationship with complete and, and robust disclosure and lower borrowing costs, and there's a, there, there is also a positive correlation between less than robust disclosure and higher borrowing costs. So think about it, if, 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 I, am, if I am forthright, if I am transparent in, in my disclosures, in my official statements, in my, uh, in my continuing disclosures, uh, the, the evidence suggests that my borrowing costs are in fact lower. I think we know this uh, just in trend, uh, inherently and, and through, through um, uh, experience in our markets, although uh, we now have some academic rigor, rigor around that. Um, but I also uh, think that it's important uh, to, to notice that um, the market also will eventually, and it's not, we're not there yet, uh, let, me, let me just uh, digress for one moment. We're getting more and more attention in the tax exempt municipal market on ESG and green, environmental, social, and government governance, and then and then green uh, bond investing. The the issue is that there's not a lot of uh, structure that we can place around this. Let me say this: that if in fact a municipal government isn't being forthright and isn't being transparent and up to date and complete in their disclosures, you get a haircut on the governance component of that ESG. And there is a lot of foreign demand right now for ESG and green investing, and it's a trend that we're seeing in the municipal bond market. And the G part of that, the governance part of that, demands continuing disclosure that's transparent, it's up to date, and it's accurate. And so the, the paradox, if you will, is that while all of this is in the name of environmental ESG and green, to the extent that you're not being exactly uh, forthright, and I'm not suggesting that, that these lawsuits aren't that way. What I am saying that if, if a government isn't being forthright in its disclosures, you actually get uh, nicked on the G part of ESG and green. I think that's interesting. But then there's the regulatory, the regulatory. And this is my third point, and I'm going to wrap up with this. Some of you may know uh, that, that the SEC has scarcely little uh, governance, oh, direct governance, over state and local governments. And this is constitutional. They're sovereign. They're, they're sub-sovereign and sovereign entities. And um, the way that that um, the way that the regulatory structure works is that uh, in 1975, the Tower Amendment uh, created the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. The Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board's tentacles into state and local governments is actually very limited, and it is through the dealer community, the broker-dealer community. So you have this removed. Um, you have this removed um, control of the regulators over state and local governments. You, the, the MSRB writes the rules to, to, uh, to, to make broker-dealers require certain things from the issuers and continuing disclosure. Um, but here's the, the thing that I think is the most important with this. If we find out in any number of lawsuits that talk about these contradictory, contradictory um, um, claims in terms of disclosure versus legal action. One of the concerns that I have and one of the concerns that issuers in general should have going forward is that if fraud is suspected or discovered, it could open, it could open the doors for the SEC then to regulate or to, excuse me, to investigate and, and uh, get their um, become involved, I, I guess is the right way to say it. So where, where the regulators may uh, not have direct authority today, if there is fraud, then all of a sudden that's an open door for them. And so issuers ought to be uh, put on warning that these things, whether, whether or not the merits are, are uh, true, whether or not the claims are accurate, if you're not doing this, you open the door for fur further scrutiny from federal regulators. Okay, thanks, Steve. That was that was very interesting indeed. Um, before we turn to the general uh, Q and A session, I'm going to abuse my position as moderator uh, to pose uh, one question to each of our panelists. Uh, let me simply ask uh, each of the five questions. Actually, there are four of them. 
uh, and then we'll just start with um, each panelist in turn. For David Bookbinder, um, let me ask the following. Uh, there really does seem to me to be a sense that the litigation that we're now seeing is a, at least in some substantial part, a uh, reaction to the failure of Congress um, to uh, adopt uh, greenhouse gas emissions policies and the election combined with the election of Donald Trump uh, and his efforts to reverse the regulatory endeavors of the Obama administration, the Climate Action Plan, and all the uh, all the associated regulations. So, what I what let me let me finish asking each of the, all four of my questions, and but then David, what I'd like you to address is the following: Isn't there something uh, to uh, Andy Grossman's point that there's a real separation of powers issue here? and something deeply undemocratic about the effort to use the judiciary to impose these policies. For Andrew, um, if I understood David's basic point correctly, it is that in fact the disclosures in the Muni bond offerings are, have been a good deal fuller than uh, has been claimed by the defendants in the litigation, if I understand uh, David's point. And I'd like you to address that. Do you, do you view that as correct, that in fact the disclosures are, have been more, more complete than has uh, been commonly advertised? For both uh, Mike McCracken and Pat Michaels, um, if I understand the latest uh, satellite measurements of uh, bulk atmosphere temperatures, not just for the uh, troposphere. Um, my understanding is that the data for, the, la for the, the satellite data for the period beginning in 1979 shows an average temperature increase of a tenth of a degree per decade plus uh, plus or minus three one hundredths of a degree is a standard deviation on either side. And that seems not to be consistent with the land ocean record published by NASA. So I'd like each of you to address what I think, and maybe I'm just wrong, I'm a lowly economist, I'm not a climate scientist, but it looks to me as if the satellite record um, which, is, which I think is largely consistent with the radio sonder weather balloon record is not very consistent with the land ocean record. And I'd like you to address that. And then for Steve Winterstein, um, there's a, I, I've not read the, um, the paper that you mentioned, uh, but it seems to me that disclosure, however it's measured, may be a proxy for something else. And it may be that the municipalities that provide better disclosure are the ones that are more credit worthy on other grounds. And so I'm wondering if the paper, which again I have not read, is measuring the wrong thing. That's part of a larger problem that you and I discussed earlier today. I just find it very hard to believe that the marginal investors in the market are fooled. Uh, for the same reason that I think that uh, ratings agencies, Standard and Poor's and the rest, are essentially worthless. And uh, I, I really wonder if disclosures or non-disclosures matter um, in, in the context of a market in which it's the behavior of marginal investors that drive interest rates or bond prices. And so I'd like you to address that. So David, why don't, why don't you take a couple of minutes and um, perhaps address the question I just, uh, I just posed for you. Um, if I understand it correctly, you started out with the idea of uh, the, uh, hold it, even before I get to that, since the embargo time on me is now over, uh, in the Scannon in, and myself personally are co-counsel in the case that was filed today by uh, the county of uh, Boulder County uh, San Miguel County and the city of Boulder against Exxon and Suncor. It was filed, I guess, about 17 minutes ago in state court in Colorado. Um, 
So are you billing for your time here today? <laughs> uh, no, as a matter of fact, it's one of the interesting things. Well, we are representing... That, that, that was a joke, dude. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, uh, but it is relevant to something uh, Steve said, which is um, I don't think in any of the cases these, the municipalities are paying for the attorneys. Uh, I think the other, the fo previously filed cases, uh, the uh, law firms are footing all the costs. Uh, and in our case, we are doing that as well, uh, and our services are pro bono. Would that uh, be true for the depositions and any appeals? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. The the, the, qu the question is. Uh, but I, I just I just oh. wanted to do that dis disclosure Fine. thing. No for problem. Okay. Go ahead. So the question is, um, the idea that this is somehow a violation of separation of powers or undemocratic, I find extremely amusing to be hearing that at AEI when. AEI and CEI and Cato and Heritage for decades have been screaming at the top of their lungs, don't regulate polluters. Do not regulate polluters under no circumstances. Well, wait, wait, polluters. David, if I, uh, first of all, I cannot speak for CEI. AEI does not take institutional positions. Uh, individuals uh, at right. AEI. Okay. Who say, remain unnamed. Who say that don't regulate, but the appropriate way to deal with it is common law tort suits. Who would AI? Well, let's not get into uh, that. We, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. So the idea that the people are being criticized by the conservative factions in Washington, D.C. for filing common law tort suits when for decades they have said that is the appropriate mechanism for dealing with issues of pollution, I find deeply ironic. More importantly, these cases are not filed as reactions to what does or does not happen in Washington. It has nothing to do with the failure of Congress to act. It has nothing to do with the Trump administration rolling back the modest regulatory programs of the Obama administration. We're dealing with local governments that have things that they have to do um, they have services they have to provide to their taxpayers, and they are facing increased costs from things like wildfires and droughts and increased freeze-thaw cycles wreaking havoc with roads and bridges being damaged by increased scour in streams and water supply issues. The list goes on and on, and these are local governments, and they have an obligation to their citizens to deliver these services. And if those services are getting more expensive because the demands on them are greater and greater and greater, we're faced with a very simple issue, which is who is going to pay for the increased road repair? Who's going to pay for increased municipal water supplies? Who's going to pay for wildfire mitigation and then fighting wildfires? Is it going to be the entities that sold the product, which were our fossil fuels, they sold fossil fuels knowing that these would be the consequences of their products being sold? So we Defendants who sold products knowing that these consequences would then happen. And now, when defendants are acknowledging that climate change is real and they're acknowledging that fossil fuels have caused these problems, their response is to say, well, our future business plans are to make even more of these making your problem worse. And by the way, not only are we going to make more of them, we're going to make higher carbon, more carbon intensive fuels. So there you have it. That's the narrative. Who pays for it? Is it going to be the taxpayers, for instance, of San Miguel County, population 8,000? Um, or is it going to be the people who sold these things knowing this would happen? That's the, that's the issue. That's the narrative. Um, and all of these cases are, are heading into court. Um, we'll get some interesting answers uh, through the course of the litigation. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to seeing the response in our case. Well, well, hang on, Andrew. Do you have something to say about Cato?
Yeah, I was just wondering, <clears throat> you said, you did say that Cato uh, had taken a record, uh, taken a position against um, the, these torts, tort cases. Um, you may be right, but I'm not familiar with anything like that in the recent past. Can you point that uh, out uh, to I'm, me? I'm, I'm, I'm saying that they've said don't regulate. The appropriate thing to do is bring tort litigation. Uh, we'll be posting something on our website, an essay that Jerry Taylor and I have written that, as a matter of fact, quotes extensively from people at Cato, including Okay, okay. In Cato we'll, we'll look forward to seeing that. Andrew, why don't you go ahead and uh, address, uh, if you would, the uh, question I posed to you. Sure. Um, the question was, you know, based on what uh, David said, was there, in fact, um, correct and complete uh, disclosures, I guess, in the bond offerings, and is that consistent uh, with what's been asserted in the lawsuits. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it's a very technical question. Securities law is very complicated. There are standards for these things. It seemed to me, just reading them, and I actually did read a couple of the, uh, I guess, the bond, I don't know what you call them, prospectuses or something like that. I'm, Official I, as, statement, OS. I, I, as you can tell, I'm not a, uh, a securities uh, attorney. Um, and so my, my advice on the topic is worth what you're paying for it. Um, but having read them, it seemed to me that there was arguably some tension between some of the representations that were made uh, in the disclosures versus some of the representations that were made in the lawsuits. Is that material? Uh, is it the kind of thing that amounts to securities fraud or a failure to disclose or a violation of a regulation uh, or any of the things that you might point to? Honestly, beats me. Uh, it seems like it's enough, uh, at the very least, that it would be warranted and that it is warranted uh, for there to be an investigation, for there to be somebody, you know, who, for the regulators who look at these things to take a look at them and determine, you know, did the cities live up to their, their obligations. But let me say that I think if you step back a little bit, the question, you know, were the bond disclosures and the, and the, the litigation disclosures, were they consistent? I, I think the thing to realize that if they were, it was basically a fluke because the decisions to enter some of these lawsuits are, are very political decisions. Um, what we've seen is attorneys reaching out to municipalities, offering them effectively a free ride. As David said, you know, the, the generally the attorneys in these cases are not asking for any money from the municipalities. They're not asking for the municipalities to fund any outlays or anything of that sort. So they come to them basically with, with a free lunch. Uh, join the lawsuit. You'll get some political benefits. You can have a press release. Um, we'll take care of everything. Your attorneys can, you know, sign it and, and scrutinize it and do whatever they would like. Uh, and there's a varying degree of involvement of the municipal and, or county attorneys uh, in these different lawsuits. It really does vary quite a bit from almost nothing uh, to, you know, a little bit more hands-on role. So, I mean, if there was something that was inconsistent in the lawsuits versus the disclosures, I mean, honestly, it wouldn't surprise me because probably nobody thought about it. Um, and, if they're, and if they are consistent, well, good for them. I guess, uh, I guess they got it right. Um, but like I said, it, you know, these, these things, uh, many of the attorneys bringing them, they're not charging, but they're, they're on contingency. Um, they get paid in that fashion. I've never heard of uh, one of these being done pro bono before, and if, if so, I mean, I think, that's, I think that represents a change in the usual practice. Um, in, in our experience, several of them have been described by the attorneys of, as pro bono when they, in fact, had a contingency fee arrangement uh, guaranteeing them, if there were uh, proceeds, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, in fees uh, at the end of the day. So you can certainly understand why these uh, lawsuits get brought. You can certainly understand uh, why it is there might be these kinds of discrepancies. Um, so I, I think that's really the way to look at it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, um, if you would address the, um, my question about the consistency between the satellite record and the uh, land ocean record. Okay, l l let me say just a couple of General things, though, in response to Pat first. So there are, uh, well, science is, scientists are taught to be skeptical, to disagree, to look for inconsistencies. Um, and that's how we advance science, is reconciling inconsistencies. And uh, skeptics have identified things that are inconsistent. And what that has led to over the history of these studies is everybody sort of looking at these kind of things, figuring it out and working it out and the skeptics sort of move on to the next one after that one's been answered. And there's often some abuses and sort of misrepresentations of what's compared there. Uh, if you go back to my definition of what climate models are doing, they're making projections. Those are conditional predictions. Pat said predict, he didn't say project. And so what those models have done that are going up there 
has said, well, we're going to run our case, and we don't know if any volcanoes or other things are going to occur, so we're going to run them without that, and you get some warming. And then some volcanoes happen, actually, in the real record, and so the observational record looks different, and they make a big stink about it, I mean, sort of comparing apples and oranges. So there are a whole bunch of things like that that go on, and you really need to wait, let the, the scientific community have time to respond to all these things. Pat and I have sort of a history of some of these things going on over time and stuff, so, so just be careful about it. Okay, on this, um, I might say one more issue on the issue of knowing and when they knew it, because he said that. So I was privileged to uh, get to speak of the Exxon Mobil. I was invited by a bunch of nuns from New Jersey to represent them as a scientist at the Exxon Mobil shareholders meeting two years ago uh, when Rex Tillerson was still chair. And one of the things I cited to them was a, a quote from a 1985 assessment done by the Department of Energy and a chapter on projecting climate change, of which the authors were a professor from NYU and Brian Flannery, who was sort of the scientist person for ExxonMobil and became the person. And their, their projection was one degree by, this is 1985, one degree by 2000 and two to five degrees by, in, in the, more in the next century, which is almost pretty precise to what we are at today. So they've actually known um, you have to decide how high it was known or something like that. Finally, on this issue of the troposphere versus the temperature, so, uh, versus the satellite record, um, the idea that they should be the same is, and in, in the tropics where he shows or something, is that there's convection going on. There's vertical mixing of the atmosphere going on. Um, but that doesn't happen everywhere. It doesn't happen out over the Pacific Ocean where there's, the waters in all the stratus clouds. Uh, it doesn't happen in the polar regions where strong inversions form. What happens is you start get, you can get much more warming in lots of re warming in polar regions, that it, because it's an inversion. It's a very cold surface and it's warming up a little bit, a thin layer of the air, and you don't see that up in the full troposphere. So the first thing is you're expecting them to be the same. Okay, that's not an expectation that is necessarily the case, although it is often pitched. Uh, that way, and so you have to really look at the differences and what happened. We live at the surface. What matters is looking at the surface. The Berkeley group has looked at the surface records totally independently, funded partly by the Koch brothers even, as I recall, and have come out with essentially the same value that everybody else is getting for the surface. So, uh, you know, okay, there are differences. We do explain them. I know people who are working to try and better represent these graphs, but when you compare things that are apples and oranges, you get differences. Um, and so, okay, I thanks. guess that's what I Pat, same comment question. in that regard. Oh, I'm sure. sorry. The, Mike, were you done? I'm sorry. Did I interrupt you? Yeah, you, no, I was just saying there's done. been a, whole, a number of influences that make it so that maybe the temperature didn't rise as much. There's issues of surface warming there. Uh, I mean, if, you were, if I were to go back to my graph or you go to your graph for 1940s, you will see there's a difference between what's happening. It turns out there's a, quite a difference and a bias in the measurement of temperatures during World War II. They measured it differently. Ships went different places. When the people went out to measure the air temperature, they didn't go out to a ship and shine a flashlight on it, because if you did it, you'd get sunk, sunk by a submarine. So they did it back by the, the uh, steering wheelhouse with the heat coming off the, off the uh, ship to affect it. So you get a warmer temperature, and so you say, oh, there's a disagreement and you say it's models. No, observations have problems too. So I, I'm just saying be, be cautious. Let the scientific community, which goes mm -hmm. through these assessments and academies and, and reviews, and you said you contribute review comments. That's good. Yeah. Pat, Pat why, don't you, uh, why don't you address the same question I'll, if you I'll would. I'll start off with this graph. Um, this is the tro tropical mid-troposphere. Uh, not looking at the model output, which is pretty bad, except for INMCM4, but looking at the circles and the squares, uh, the circles are the four balloon data sets, those have uh, global coverage, and the squares are satellite data sets. It looks like they're measuring the same thing. Now also, this begins in 1979 when the satellite first begins to send back data and ends in 2016. Um, the 
the uh, disparity uh, continues to grow, but these are not these are much closer to a forecast of the computer models because the models are actually run in a hindcast mode where you know what the carbon dioxide concentration is. You might say the future would be more of a projection because somehow you have to have some idea of what carbon dioxide, how much carbon dioxide is going to go into the atmosphere, but we sure as heck know what the concentration was in 1979, we know it 89, 99, and we know it for today. So that's much more, much more like a forecast. That's and they're run based on year 2000. So you can compare results to past simulations. They're run without a number of, of these forcings. And so you have the additional problem in the vertical. And I reiterate uh, that the satellite is much more consistent with the weather balloon data than it is with the models. The difference between surface and, and satellite measured temperatures, though, there are realities on that. Unfortunately, the handling of the surface record is sometimes as questionable or can be questioned uh, as the problem with the inversions in the high latitudes not probably, probably not being picked up in the satellite. One of the reasons there's a big spike in the surface records is uh, Jim Hansen uh, and then a lot of other people started doing this, took high latitude stations in the northern hemisphere, <clears throat> places like Resolute, uh, Barrow, et cetera. And they extended their coverage, I believe, up to 1,000 kilometers out into the Arctic Ocean. And guess what? Those land stations are pretty darn warm. So that put, put a very huge spike in the very high latitude temperatures. Now, if we had some ice cubes and we put this into a glass and had a mixed ice water ocean, if you will, the temperature will remain 33 degrees until all the ice melts. Similarly, in the summer in the Arctic, there's ice all over the place in the regions that those temperature records are being extended into. Um, Judy Curry has commented on this. I have. Roy Spencer has. It just defies logic that you would do that. And of course, it will give you an answer that you want. And the satellite has a problem adjudicating that too, but both sides are punished, as they said in Romeo and Juliet. Okay, thanks, Pat. Steve, uh, with respect to uh, my question about whether or not disclosure, however defined, is a proxy for something else, and whether or not disclosure, however defined again, matters. Well, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, and I referenced that one study, and I don't think by any measure it's conclusive, but um, I think what we what we can say is that if we look at a at a, the way that a specific issuer trades relative to the gold standard, and I'm using that euphemistically, a AAA rated bond, uh, that that's going to be the way that we we ultimately determine. Um, determine, number one, if there is a spread, and then we take it a step further and try to determine what, what uh, contributes to that spread. So for example, uh, believe it or not, uh, the gold standard in the municipal bond market, of all things, is the state of Maryland. Uh, it is the AAA rated, uh, uh, it is one AAA rated state. Uh, it, it is uh, so because of the relatively small amount of debt that they have outstanding and the wealth uh, patterns that they have, particularly in the greater Washington, D.C. area. So um, so Maryland carries a AAA, AAA rating, and whenever we look at a spread, when I talk about spread, I'm talking a yield spread, we use the, the, the spread to the AAA curve, and Maryland is often the main contributor, sort of the benchmark or the hallmark contributor to that AAA curve. Other, other other names like North Carolina, the state of um, Georgia, and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, in, in terms of disclosure, uh, again, it's, it's so very fragmented in our market. As I mentioned, we have 65,000 issuers. It's very difficult to get consistency and to understand that consistency. But um, experientially, uh, what we do know is that when we lack disclosure, um, it's probably a symptom, uh, I think, um, of, of other problems. It might be the level of sophistication of the, um, of the uh, 
the governing board. It may be political in nature. For example, um, there are things like passing of budgets, uh, which, which uh, go hand in hand with uh, things like disclosure, where we may get a political gridlock where we can't get a budget passed. We knew that that was the case in Illinois, and there are other states that are just um, perennially late in passing budgets and so forth. But I think you do raise an interesting point, and that is that the smaller, less sophisticated government, governments uh, will probably uh, tend to not be as up to speed um, on, on what, the rulings, what the rules are in terms of re uh, requirements, and they're not as sophisticated in recognizing uh, something that's material, for example, that they would need to disclose, as are the larger, more sophisticated governments. The larger, more sophisticated governments tend to come to market more frequently. So if we look at, um, for example, the state of New York or the city of New York or the New York State Thruway, um, they're certainly going to be more up to speed. They're going to be more cognizant of their disclosure requirements, and they're going to be more on time and, and, and so forth than, for example, a small county somewhere in the, in the south or a small school district or uh, in, in my home state of Pennsylvania, in some Netherland county where, um, you know, it's the local electrician, plumber, and carpenter that are on the school board, and the bond council is a local attorney uh, who settles estates, um, you know, on the weekends. Okay, good, thanks. So now we're going to turn uh, to our general q and I have instructions uh, from the powers that be. Are we live streaming this event today? Yes, we are indeed, so you should know that. Uh, please wait for a microphone to be handed to you before asking your question. Please speak clearly into the microphone. Keep your questions brief. Ensure you're asking a question, not making a statement, so the Jeopardy rule, I guess, applies. <laughs> so um, with that, uh, let's, uh, anybody uh, have a question? This gentleman here. Perhaps you could um, state your name and your affiliation. My name is Devin Watkins with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, I have uh, San Mateo's bond offerings right here that I read through, the ones that you had quoted up on the page. It is true that they note the existence of the paper concerning global warming, but the bond offerings never say anything about the opinion of the county. Do they agree with this paper? Do they disagree with it? Nothing about that in the entire paragraph. The only thing that they note about the county and what it thinks as to sea level rise is that it's unable to predict such sea level rise. Uh, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how the county fails to mention what its own opinion on such a paper is. Um, that's a good question. I'm, I do not represent San Mateo County. My uh, opinion would be that they lay out the scientific evidence of scientists who scientifically say you're looking at 1.4 meter sea level rise. And then they say, we don't have an opinion on this because we're just the municipal government of San Mateo, but this is what the experts are saying. So, yeah, I don't see what the problem is. I think it's really great when they say, this is what the scientists are saying, and we do not, you know, we don't dispute it. it this is what they're saying. Uh, actually, uh, 1.4 is not what the scientists are saying. I believe that's an outlier estimate. Um, I think it's from, from Max Planck Institute. No, more notably, the west coast of the United States, for tectonic reasons, has been experiencing quite a bit less sea level rise than much of the rest of the world. If you go up uh, north of there into uh, Alaskan coast, sea level has actually fallen quite a bit. So uh, I think San Mateo actually had a good point. <laughs> we just, just mentioned one. They should have mentioned a few more. Uh, and they should have taken into account local conditions. Uh, if, if I could add, I mean, I, I think what you identified is exactly, the, um, well, I would say is among the tensions that exist between you know, what's, what's stated in the lawsuit versus uh, what's disclosed uh, in, the, in the bond offerings. Um, it, the, the disclosure requirements for those kinds of offerings are hyper-technical, they're frequently uh, litigated, there are different laws in different jurisdictions, different courts arrive at different determinations. 
I mean, I, I think as I said earlier, you know, it's the kind of thing that might raise eyebrows and makes you wonder, uh, you know, are they being on the level? Are they disclosing the right thing? Um, do they have some obligation to do a little bit more? These are all really tough questions, and it, they're certainly things that are worth looking into and getting that kind of hyper-technical analysis. Um, I might just also say on the sea level issue that where the, the way it's being expressed is uncertainty in a particular year. And yet what we're on a path toward is a long-term rise. And so the issue is more not how much sea level rise is going to occur, but exactly when it's going to, when it's going to occur. And so what would be a better way, I've been suggesting for some way, in, in representing the sea level issue is to say that uh, given what we know from how sensitive it is to temperature variations on the global basis from past records, that you're likely to get to a meter, say, by some period of time between, and it might be between 2070 and it might be between 2150 or something. There's going to be an uncertainty that way. But we're going to get to, to a meter, or we're going to get, and we're going to, these, all these projections have it continuing to go for quite some time. It's hard to slow. And so, so in thinking about what, what cities are doing or what anybody's doing for a particular time, if you're thinking about a long-term issue, you better be thinking about long-term continuing rise and not just the value in 2050, because you're going to keep going beyond that. Um, so, so if you have long-term infrastructure, hospitals and other things don't locate it in, in low lands or something. We may not get there in that particular year. Probably, you know, we won't, it won't hit it exactly by any means, but, but we'll go, we'll be going up, and that's what needs to really be looked at in these things. Okay, uh, this lady here, uh, how can I? My name is Bonnie Wachtel. I work in the investment industry. And first, this is fabulous panel. I love this. So I'm not going to waste my question on disclosure because I haven't heard anything here that would generate disclosure, this kind of speculation of what's going on in the future, as I understand it in the investment world, unless you're interested in virtue signaling and want to buy your securities on the basis of that kind of indication in the material. So let me go directly to the issue at hand, which is, um, is there enough there there that would in any way implicate the investment industry? And I could ask Mr. McCracken, I'm too polite for that. So I'll ask Pat Michaels. The, the thing that drives me absolutely what, 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 what am I crazy about the- How do I the, interpret that? All right, the thing that has me, has me absolutely crazy you about the- You don't deserve the, courtesy, Pat, but we already knew that, so just sit there. <laughs> Well, the, as I say, I'm going to yeah. tell you what drives me what, crazy what, what about your, the climate. What is, what is your question? It's coming. Okay. Is the sense is the assertion that there is a consensus among scientists, and I really think that the movement has lost a lot of credibility with that assertion. As I understand what Mr. Michael said, he is analytically denying Mr. McCracken's statement that the observations justify the model predictions, which are supposed to go into securities filings. That's ridiculous. My question to Mr. Michaels is, is this situation getting any better? The fight, you mentioned some new scientists and superstars coming in. The fight against this sense that it's all, the decision has been rendered, that this is some crisis level problem and there's no let's, point discussing. Let's let, Pat, let's let Pat answer that. Good. And then Mike, if you have something to add after Pat, that'd be fine. Whoa. As long as you have that disparity that you're looking at on the, on the plot there, uh, it seems to me that you have a choice. You can bet on the family of the models, which is the colored spaghetti uh, above the observations, or you can bet on what works. Interestingly enough, the INM CM4 model has less warming uh, uh, to the year 2100 than any of the others, and its sensitivity to temperature is the lowest of all 32. Now, 
if you're going to go with something that's working, you have now an issue that people are probably going to adapt to. And I can't tell you for the life of me what the energy structure of our society is going to be 100 years from now. So you, you're getting to time frames where investment may not be wise and where the, where the smartest thing to do is to save capital and use it for the, for the technological development of the future that we don't even know. Yeah, Pat, I think the question from, from this woman was something along the lines of, has the claim of consensus over the past decades uh, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting, uh, harmed the credibility of, of someone. And I'm not quite sure what she has in the back of her mind. Science generally, the scientists Interestingly, are claiming. Interesting. The question is, is it getting better? Are you seeing more ad adaptation on the skeptic side? Adaptation on the skeptic side. Oh, uh, well, I mean, th that depends upon the individual. There are um, a lot of incentives in science that unfortunately create distortions. And I, I, might, I might point out that at 4.30, Competitive Enterprise Institute is going to have a presentation on um, the systematic problems that ha are arising in science. Uh, I have a book on that, and one of the chapters is on climate change, but it's not just climate change. It has to do with the way that we do science. And there is a, as a result of that, there's kind of tribal fractionation. Uh, I don't see that going away, frankly. Okay, but, Mike, do you okay, want to add something yes, on this? Well, yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, so, so as I said, this is a very complicated problem. There are lots of things in the details. We're down as an example here, really into some of the details about whether this matters and how it's getting worked out compared to the fundamental things we know about it, which were clear in a President's Science Advisory Council report delivered to President Johnson in 1965 and discussed in Congress and at the cabinet, cabinet level. So the CO2 concentration is going up due to human activities. And the world is 80% dependent on fossil fuels right now. It's going to keep going up. Uh, past climates, the climate of the planets, other things, all indicate that the composition of the atmosphere affects the temperature. Uh, we've seen patterns of change that are indicative in basically every sense with only greenhouse gases going up. You can argue exact amounts and exactly when, that's, those are sort of down there. So we're gonna keep doing it in the future, we're gonna have further rise. If you change the climate, you have important impacts on the environment, just walk up a mountain or something and see the landscapes change. Or if you look at the paleo record and you look at sea level and how it's changed by very large amounts, the fact that it's changed in the past is the reason of concern and stuff. And w w what we know is if you want to stop it, if you want to stabilize it and have a stable concentration, you have to basically go to zero emissions of fossil fuels. Okay, so we're on trend. Exactly what's going to happen, where, exactly when, is down on the details. That wasn't how the tobacco issue sort of got covered on a policy front about knowing how each study was going and differences between it. It was very high up. But for the climate, that's something people live in. And so they talk about, and the media want to cover the details. They're interested in being in the forefront where people differ and trying to reconcile things. And so you don't hear much about what people agree on. Yeah. Oh. And, and so, I mean, there's, I, I think, a, a created sense of concern that has us delaying taking action, which is going to make it harder and harder and harder yeah. to do things in the future. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you, Mike. Uh, David yeah. has something to add. Yeah, we're here talking about the nuisance cases, right? Okay. Uh, there's no dispute by, between the two sides in the nuisance cases as to the science. Uh, three weeks ago, I was in Judge Alsup's courtroom in San Francisco when Ted Boutros, representing Chevron, got up and for two hours marched PowerPoint by PowerPoint through the fifth assessment report from the IPCC saying, we agree with this, we agree with this, we agree with this, we agree with this, for two hours. Ted Boutros, representing Chevron, 
got up there and said, we totally accept the fifth assessment report as the consensus science on the state of the climate. So in terms of the nuisance cases, there's, there's no there there. The answer is the defendants have said yes. The fifth assessment is the consensus science. That's it. It's over. Okay. We, we can discuss the virtues and vices of the fifth assessment report some other time. <laughs> Uh, okay, anyone else with uh, this gentleman here, Marlowe? Hi, Marlowe Lewis with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Let's stipulate for the sake of argument that minimizing climate change risk for a profit, knowingly doing so, is prosecutable fraud, okay? There are certain logical consequences if you accept that proposition, and I want to know if the panel accepts those logical consequences. One of them is exaggerating, hyping climate risk for a profit. Knowingly doing, doing so is also prosecutable fraud. We have, for example, a, Attorney Generals United for Clean Power. These guys are always screaming that the sky is falling, and why? It's right there in the title of their organization. They want to benefit renewable energy companies. Many of them are elected officials. I bet they get contributions from some of those comp companies. Another implication is that if minimizing climate change risk, knowingly doing so, is prosecutable fraud, then minimizing climate policy risk uh, and knowingly doing so is prosecutable fraud. Now, if you look for, at the uh, Paris Agreement, for example, and you accept the consensus scientist, science, not the Russian model that Pat was talking about, in order to achieve the mid-century emission reduction target, you basically have to force developing countries today to dramatically reduce their consumption of fossil fuels. And yet, the people who are pushing this agenda would have you believe that you can put an energy-starved world. I mean, we're talking about areas of the world where a billion people still have no electricity. You can put that energy-starved portion of the planet on an energy diet, and no one could possibly be harmed except a few fat cat CEOs of oil and coal companies. Now, pushing that line, I'm asking, uh, that seems to me like knowingly minimizing the risks of climate change policy. I'm not making a prediction that that's going to happen to those developing countries because all kinds You're making of factors a projection. could intercede. Marlo, Marlo, you, you know, gotta, you gotta but get to I'm asking, Marlo. that's a projection that I think would be supported by the big picture, and yet people want to pretend that that's not happening. Is that prosecutable fraud in the view of the panel? Thank you very much. Okay. That I, strikes me that's a question for David and Andrew to begin with. Uh, I'm not sure what the question was, Marlo. The question is <laughs> if, if, if it is prosecutable fraud to minimize uh, the dangers of increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, is it also a prosecutable fraud to overstate the dangers of increasing greenhouse gas concentrations? And is to that minimize the dangers of regular of right and minimizing minimizing the cost to be imposed on actual human beings? Are those also prosecutable frauds in, okay, in, not, why not? right. Why is sauce not for the gambler? Uh, I, I'm still not quite sure what the question is, but I think you're saying is exaggerating um, climate impacts, is that a form of fraud? Is, is that, am I getting to what your question is? Let me state it in one sentence. Okay. If knowingly minimizing the risks of climate change knowingly hyping the risks of climate change for a profit also prosecutable fraud and similarly or conversely is minimized knowingly minimizing the risks of climate policy prosecutable fraud if we assume that minimizing the risks of climate change is prosecutable fraud if you can't understand that no, david you're uh, pretending no, okay no, come okay. on marlo let come on let's right, don't get Andrew, excited do you want to take a shot at this i mean in my view, you know, none of these things are, are prosecutable fraud. I mean, except for when, you know, in, in circumstances that, that I've never heard here. I mean, there's this idea that, like, there's some, like, guy at ExxonMobil who 30 years ago, he knew. <laughs> Nobody else knew, but he knew. 
And I mean, it's, it's, it's ludicrous on the face of it. Um, you know, uh, Michael has been telling us here that, you know, this was all known to the public uh, in, the, in the Johnson administration, which I don't know if that's true either. But uh, the idea that, that, that there is some industry-wide conspiracy to hide, you know, to have this secret information that nobody else knew about, about, you know, these complicated areas of climate science that where the industry has many fewer scientists looking into, you know, years ago had many fewer scientists looking into these issues than academic institutions, than governments. Um, it, you know, if there's some kind of conspiracy, some kind of criminal conspiracy, it's, it's just not apparent to me exactly what it was or how it worked or what the effect of it was, uh, just given that, you know, the information of all these things is out there. So my view is none of these things, uh, at least as you've described them as I understand it, uh, can be fraud, should be fraud. I mean, this is how we debate and discuss things. And, you know, again, okay, at least for the moment, you get to do that. Well, okay. So let, no, Mike, let's, let's go on to the next question. We only have a few minutes left before we have to adjourn. So uh, does anyone else have a question? Well, hang uh, Okay, this. Yeah, thank you. This will be real short. One of the things that you see in some of the climate skeptic literature is the fact that there are going to be positive effects from warming, warming in a lower level. For example, Canada is going to develop a lot more agrarian fields, that sort of thing. Um, reactions to that, is that also something that should be taken into account if the, you think the, that these the risks The Obama administration uh, <laughs> right. calculated something called the social cost of carbon. Right. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the numbers always came out very, very high. The OMB guidelines for making such calculations explicitly state that among other discount rates, you need to use 7% discount rate. 7% is the historical discount rate, at least for the last 115 years. Um, if you do that and you assume that the sensitivity of temperature to carbon dioxide is not the central sensitivity of the models that are blowing the forecast as we speak, but is the central sensitivity of the INM CM4 model, you get a net benefit uh, for the emissions of carbon dioxide <clears throat> all the way out into the end of this century. So yeah, there are benefits. Plants grow better. We all know that. And the Earth, Earth is clearly getting greener. You can see it from right. satellite data. Right. NASA's, so, NASA's. so um, having been on several assessment teams where that kind of comment comes in and we go looking at <clears> it, <throat> what, you, what you find is, yeah, there are some benefits, but the uh, impacts are much more severe. Um, if you think about the United States, just to take a specific example, but it would go generally. Okay, so, so the northern tier of states gets a bit warmer, so presumably it has less heating bills. Um, they have relatively tight homes. They save a little bit of money. So a lot of people save a little bit of money. But if you live down on the Gulf Coast and you're going to get hotter and hotter, where people who have very open homes uh, would have a very expensive time putting in air conditioning, and yet that's what people in Texas do to survive summers in Arizona and everything, is you live inside. Um, what you find is that the negative impacts are much larger. Um, Canada, yes, but does it have the right soils? Does it have the amount of light that you need for the crops? And so, so you have to be very careful in looking. And people, we have been looking and looking and looking for positive benefits, and they're very, very hard to find. Saying CO2 is a benefit depends on there being water resources and other nutrients there to help plants grow. They do much better in greenhouses, but if you're outside, it, that's not necessarily the case. Mike, vastly so, more so people to be die from cold than heat. Isn't it shocking oh, I don't, yeah, that people take their discretionary people, income and move people, to hot cities? Right. Okay, anyway, it is 3.30. Uh, panelists, I really am quite proud to have organized such a stimulating and intelligent group. Thank you so much for, uh, for your time and efforts uh, delivering your statements and uh, comments yeah, today. And thank you to our from, audience. They don't, huh? they don't die from cold. They dry from being together. Okay, thank you. Good. So much. Well, yeah, it was fun. Uh